On November 6, 1999, when Jennifer Watkins failed to return home after her shift at the Memorial Hospital, her husband, Michael Watkins, called the Fountain Police Department to report her missing. On the same day, Irene Skinner, Jennifer Watkins' mother, who babysits her grandchildren, contacted the Colorado Springs Police Department after her daughter failed to come pick up the kids. Almost immediately, a report of a missing person was initiated by the Colorado Spring Police Department. During the initial investigation, detectives and investigating patrol officers carried out interviews with Jennifer Watkins' family members and co-workers numerous times. Officers were able to discover Jennifer Watkins' car with Michael Watkins' help in an employee parking area close to Printer's Parkway and East Pike's Peak Avenue. The car was seized, but no items of evidence or hints connected to Jennifer Watkins' disappearance were found during the ensuing search. The investigators continued to search for Jennifer Watkins, interviewing people at the Memorial Hospital where she worked. While at the hospital on November 8, 1999, detectives received a word around 10 a.m. that a corpse had been discovered behind a stairwell in a section of the hospital that was still under construction. It appeared that two Dover elevator service workers entered the stairwell on the eighth level to examine and fix an elevator shaft that needed a repair. They perceived a very different and offensive smell as soon as they approached the stairwell area. When the elevator staff peered under the stairwell, they noticed what appeared to be the outline of a body bound with duct tape and covered in plastic. On request, the scene was immediately visited by investigators from the Colorado Springs Police Department Homicide Unit, Metro Crime Lab, and the El Paso County Coroner's Office. After the investigators removed the plastic, they found a deceased white female adult with brown hair. The victim was dressed in a purple blouse black slacks, and a teal uniform smock. Her clothing was laid out in a way that suggested a sexual assault had taken place. Detectives questioned a number of workers and contractors at Memorial Hospital throughout the course of the investigation. No suspect was found despite looking into more potential suspect leads. The deceased adult female's autopsy was soon completed by the El Paso County Coroner's Office, and she turned out to be 23-years-old Jennifer Watkins, who suddenly went missing a few days back. According to David Bowerman, the coroner for El Paso at the time, Jennifer had died of blunt force trauma to the head. Her death was determined to be a homicide. The question of who killed Jennifer Watkins bugged the police and her family for years. Jennifer Lee Watkins was born on the 24th of November, 1975 to William and Irene Skinner in Methuen, Massachusetts. She was the second of four children and Joseph, her youngest brother, held a special place in her heart. Jennifer obtained her high school diploma from Hanover, Colorado High School. She enjoyed socializing with friends and caring for her pets. Jennifer loved playing volleyball and wished to help people. Her love for music made her join the school band as a clarinetist. Jennifer Watkins desired a career as a nurse. She and her husband, Michael Watkins, married on the 8th of April, 1995, and roughly three years later, Michael was hired as a maintenance worker at the Memorial Hospital in Colorado Springs. Not long after, Jennifer was also hired there as a dietitian. The investigators worked tirelessly to bring justice to Jennifer's family. As part of the crime scene processing, a close inspection of the plastic used to wrap Jennifer Watkins' body turned up some hairs, fibers, and a yellow whitish stain that was eventually identified as cement. At the autopsy, further biological evidence was also gathered. The Colorado Bureau of Investigation received a number of pieces of evidence for analysis. In addition to the victim's DNA profile, two other DNA profiles were created from the evidence items submitted for processing. The plastic wrap, the victim's pants, and semen samples taken at the autopsy were used to create these profiles. Although the semen found in Jennifer Watkins' pants and in the plastic wrap matched each other, they did not match the sample taken during the autopsy. A number of potential suspects had their biological samples taken, and all of them had been exonerated because their DNA 
did not match the two unidentified DNA samples. Although there were security cameras installed all over the hospital facility, the pictures were too blurry to be of much help. Police originally concentrated on those with access to the crime site, but there were no leads. They then shifted concentration on Michael Watkins, who worked night shift in the hospital's housekeeping division. Irene Skinner, Jennifer Watkins' mother, had her doubts about Michael. According to Irene, her daughter's life took a different turn after she moved in with her husband, Michael Watkins, whom she had attended grade school with. Irene Skinner reported that Michael Watkins struggled with drug use, and more often than not, Jennifer required multiple visits to the emergency department as a result of domestic abuse. Also, in addition to his volatile personality and tumultuous relationship with Jennifer, Michael Watkins had run ins with the law in the past, which involved criminal mischief and a pallet gun incident. He was, however, interrogated multiple times as the investigation progressed and he complied fully with all the proceedings. Michael admitted he had an affair with Jennifer since one of the DNA found on Jennifer Watkins' body came from him. He, however, denied killing her. After obtaining a warrant, they searched Michael Watkins' home and discovered a pair of pants that seemed to be covered in blood. An analysis of the object revealed that it was blood, but it was Michael's blood. The two DNA samples that were taken from the crime scene didn't provide any answers. Even if the one from Jennifer's body matched Michael's DNA, it didn't raise a red flag because Michael was married to Jennifer. The other DNA sample from the plastic was unknown. The police asked Michael Watkins to take a polygraph test to which he consented and passed. Even though Michael was still a suspect, the detectives looked at other possibilities. They focused on a male hospital employee who mysteriously left town without warning or collecting his final salary immediately after the murder of Jennifer. During investigation, detectives soon discovered that the man was on probation for a murder in Louisiana, which he claimed was self-defense. When authorities located him, he rejected all accusations of involvement in Jennifer Watkins' murder and consented to provide a DNA sample. His DNA, however, didn't match the DNA discovered at the crime site where Jennifer was killed. Following a thorough investigation, no suspect was found, and the case eventually became cold. Numerous investigators have been trying to identify a suspect in Jennifer Watkins' case for the past 21 years without success. Jennifer's case remained unresolved for a while. Over the years, technological advancements in familial DNA analysis occurred. Between 2017 and 2018, cold case investigators with the help of Parabon Nanolabs, a Virginia-based DNA technology business, used DNA phenotyping to determine the physical characteristics and ancestry of the unidentified DNA evidence at the crime scene. The suspect traits was predicted using the DNA evidence found in Jennifer Watkins' pants. Parabon made an individual prediction of the suspect's ancestry, eye color, hair color, skin tone, freckling, and face shape. A snapshot composite was created by combining these physical characteristics to show what the suspect would have looked like at age 25 and with an average body mass index of 22. Due to the fact that age and body mass index cannot be established from DNA, these default values were utilized. In an effort to generate leads, this photos was subsequently released to the public. The findings showed that the murderer had fair skin, blue or green eyes, blonde or brown hair, and was around 25 years old when the crime occurred. However, investigators were able to focus on a person who police had actually interrogated in 1999 after using genetic genealogy to narrow down the suspect. The killer was Ricky Severt. According to a check of the original case report, Ricky Severt, who was 29 at the time of the murder, was questioned by investigators on November 19, 1999, as a part of the initial homicide investigation. He was employed by Memorial Hospital and was a member of the maintenance team. He started working there in April 1998. According to Ricky Sever's work schedule that he provided during his interview, 
On November 5, 1999, the day Jennifer Watkins was last seen, he would have been working a swing shift. Additionally, he denied ever having met Jennifer Watkins when asked. Finally, the culprit has been identified, but sadly, further investigation revealed that on November 2, 2001, two years after Jennifer Watkins' murder, Ricky Severt was killed in a car accident on Highway 94, just east of Colorado Springs. The investigators, however, obtained DNA samples from the suspect living relatives. According to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, the proportion of the population that may be excluded as a contributor to the DNA gathered in this case is 99.99,994%. It means Ricky Severt cannot be excluded. The 4th Judicial District Attorney's Office received the Jennifer Watkins case on October 1, 2020. For examination, the District Attorney's Office is certain that Ricky Severt killed Jennifer Watkins. The investigation into the murder of Jennifer Watkins will be closed as exceptionally cleared or death of offender because Ricky Severt had already died in a car accident in 2001. After all these years, we are grateful to finally give Jennifer Watkins' family the answers they deserve. No matter the length of time, we will always work to serve this community. And I am proud of all the cold case detectives throughout the last 21 years who have never stopped working. For Miss Watkins, not for one moment did they ever lose sight of what was most important, finding the truth for the Watkins family. And thank you to our partners. We would not have been able to solve this case without your time, skill, and dedication, said Colorado Springs Police Department Chief Vince Niski.